Cool. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Um, so, Tanzu, I think you're going to screen share and then we're both going to talk shark for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> can see it drops by all the things. So, okay, let's start then. Well, welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about GitOpsify all the things, like not just the tools, not just the apps, but also your organization. Um, so yeah, first there's a little bit introduction about ourselves. My name is John Su. I'm, a, I'm a, at Red Hat working as a site reliability engineering in Open Innovation Labs EMEA team. And um, these are our handles if you need to reach out to us. Cool. Um, my name is Donald Spring. So I'm an architect working in the uh, Red Hat Open Innovation Labs team as well. Cool. So, so let's start. Um, okay, so as well, we are in GitOps days and we, <laughs> we know that, that GitOps is on the rise and we have all our own GitOps tools inside the cluster and oh shoot, sorry, this was a live one, right? <laughs> I need to switch the screen. <laughs> Not the recording one, sorry. So. <laughs> So apparently we have all our, uh, we all have our own uh, favorite GitOps tools inside the cluster and we all doing this, right? We just come to, um, let's say Argo CD to create our applications through GitOps because we have our uh, source code repositories, we have our applications definitions and, and all we need to do is just to point that and say that I want to deploy it to my cluster and Argo CD will take care of the rest. Magic. Where is it? Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so we thought, yeah, you know, that that's pretty cool. I can go to a UI and I can click a few buttons. We're we're Kubernetes people through OpenShift. So we we've been doing this shit for years, right? We've been clicking buttons in the UI. And we thought, well, there's got to be more to this GitOps thing than just clicking a few buttons in a in a in a controller's UI. So we thought. We've got we 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 have a problem whereby we do a lot of like rapid prototyping and enablement with our customers uh, on Kubernetes using OpenShift, and we thought there's got to be a way that we can kickstart our development, and so with that is born what we call uh, the ubiquitous journey. journey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the ubiquitous journey is what we use as our kind of project Kickstarter. We like to think of it as like the big bang at the beginning of our projects. Uh, so we roll out a bunch of tooling. It's all based on some experience we had with some customers whereby, you know, if, if a customer wants to use some cool new tools, some cool new, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, thing in a, in a pipeline, like a patch broker or a hoverfly or something like that, they want to use some tool. We would um, basically write this as infrastructure as code and we would, <clears throat> we would then add it to our Git repos in order to be able to kind of automate the deployment of it. So, the Ubiquitous Journey is a project that we've been working on for a little bit over a year now, Tansu, I guess is what mm -hmm. to say. Uh, and it's basically, it's broken down into kind of two parts. The first part is sort of scaffolding some stuff inside of our cluster. It's sort of like we've got like a chicken and an egg scenario, whereby we want to get opsify all the things that we have in our cluster. So in order to do that, we need to deploy a controller. We've chosen Argo as our controller. Uh, sorry, WeaveWorks. <laughs> um, but we've chosen Argo CD. Uh, and what it does is our bootstrap will spin up some projects that will be managed by Argo and some tools that we, uh, sorry, spin up the things required in order to enable GitOps. And then we have on the right hand side here, you can see kind of the list of tools that we have for doing things like CI CD, you have things like Jenkins, Nexus, Selenium for doing browser testing, uh, as well as like collaboration tools. So in this like post COVID world, we found that moving things into like distributed mode is quite important to us. So being able to do pair programming in, in a shared space in a cluster became a, an important collaboration aspect for us. So this is the tooling that we spin up. Um, if anybody's interested, they can scan the QR code up the top right, which I think takes them to an example of a customer using this, which was the World Health Organization. Am I correct? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so let's let's get into it. Let's see what this thing looks like. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I will remove them after this. So, okay. So let's see. Cool. So, so, <clears throat> so what you've got here, so Chansu has gone to our Git repo, which again is public. She's cloned the Ubiquitous Journey project. And the way our Ubiquitous Journey project is made up of, it's basically a little bit of what I would think is just clever glue, really. So we've got one template in our chart, which is just an Argo CD application definition. Uh, and that Argo CD application definition, right at the top, you can see it says range in Apple values.applications. 
So in our Argo Apple apps, sorry, in our values tooling file, values tooling file, um, we've basically got this applications array where we can put in anything we want from just some straight up Kubernetes YAML to Helm chart to some customize or any other sort of tool, either that we write a chart for ourselves or we pull from the internet. Um, and with doing that, um, we basically tell Argo that this Git repo exists, where it'll find this list. So for example, on Sonar Cube there, we have just a little flag that says, you know, enable true, where to find the chart, uh, what version of the chart to use and where to deploy it. And then the values there on, the, on line 157 is any, any customizations or any overrides you want to pass to that chart specific for running it in OpenShift or the way we want to configure it. So, Chansu, do you think it's pretty easy to show people how we can extend this? Of course, it's just, we just need to find another application to add at the end of this file by saying that here is the new Helm chart we would like to deploy as a part of our tooling, for example, PowerFly. So oh, cool. in here, yeah, it's an um, open source Helm chart. We point to the right version we want, and we have some all right values that we would like to uh, we would like to apply to this Helm chart. So and all I need to do is, Specifically in here, we're passing in stuff to make it work with Ingress in OpenShift, which is also known as root, <laughs> because OpenShift. <laughs> so PowerFly is added from the demo. Oh. And the emojis and I push it. So now I need to go to our ubiquitous journey. You see that those are the old toolings that we just showed in the file. And now we just add PowerFly in here. Magically, so you see that this is the commit I did. Uh, <laughs> I can see the previous commits as removing hoverflux. Yeah, because I was, <laughs> I was trying right before the demo. <laughs> Spectacular, cool. So, so this is this is the ubiquitous journey project, and it, it it's it's really really customizable. And that was what I kind of wanted to show off here was you can kind of use this tool as a GitOps approach to man managing all of the things that you might need in supporting CI CD, or even uh, beyond that, again, if you think about maybe like project management tools like WeCan for Kanban boards or Code Ready Workspaces or any of the sort of additional things you might want to deploy, Etherpad or, or Mattermost if you want to do chat, as well as using the same pattern for like admining inside of your clusters. So we've also got like a day two ops YAML file in there where we've got some commonly used things that we use in OpenShift Lamb to prune, prune old builds or establish network policies. And the important thing here is that we're getting our customers used to a GitOps first driven approach to everything. Um, cool. So what happened next? Um, um, so basically we were using this for a couple of gigs, couple of engagements, get lots of really good feedback. And then we had a customer, uh, a very large airline based somewhere in Dubai. I won't name the name. Um, but a very large airline came around to us and said, this is a really, really great tool. And I really like how it's able to kickstart our development teams really, really fast. But I have, you know, I have 10 agile release trains with up to 19 teams in each one of those. How can I use this same pattern to almost automate the structure of that, as well as onboarding the new applications and their tooling using the same paradigm? And so we kind of locked our heads together and thought, well, I mean, it's basically the same problem, right? We're just, we're just, if we can define a bit of YAML that, that uh, if we can write a bit of YAML that defines how these teams are structured, then we can define the sandboxes, the projects that they would use. Uh, yeah, so over, over to you, Jan, so tell me what, tell me what we did. Yeah, that will surprise our listeners, but our response was, why not GitOps by everything? So um, we started in Kavaris and like Donald said, for this particular customer, we wanted to come up with a standard team onboarding process for each team within each release team, as well as a standard approach of application onboarding and application lifecycle. So since our ubiquitous journey approach was easy to extensible and this team that we work with was really liked it as much as we did. So we thought that GitHub methodology is, is the way that we want to go. So we came up with this release train hand chart, which is uh, in the main value file, you define teams and the application they are responsible. You see that if you look at here, we have pirates, we have Vikings, we have cowboys as teams, because why not? And you see that you see that there are also some applications that they are responsible of specifically. We were and, definitely in the cowboys team, because we're definitely <laughs> cowboy coders. <laughs> So if you look at this, here is the Viking team. They are responsible of these two applications called stations and flight search. And 
Each team can define their own uh, over their own specific applications for each environment because each team has uh, by default in in this case has two different uh, two different environment. One is called test, one is called staging, and they are defined as the uh, as folders on the right. And each fo each files in these folders in these environments have their own specific values for these environments. Like could be um could be the application version or could be the uh, database connection information or some other specific environment variables. And if you would like to like this type of environment, and if you would like to override uh, add a new team, all we need to do is to extend this values file by adding a new team and the application they're responsible of and the corresponding folder scheme to this like test and staging and then the uh, related values file for these environments and sorry i would like to also talk about this if you if also we would uh, it's easy to replicate each environment like let's say that you want to um, create a similar environment that you have in staging just to have some performance testing so you can all you need to do is to replicate environment testing and extend this values file and argo cd will pick it up and easy to create this environment for you just for some testing and you, if you want to clean this up, you just need to update the file. And you might think that this might be not so easy to understand for any team maybe while you know onboarding them to the platform, but the team would already be working either with Helm charts or Kubernetes or start to doing it because you know ideally that is where this customer would like to go to the cloud native way of working. And this is just a Helm chart of Argo CD application and Argo CD project definition, but re uh, referencing different values file. So based on our application uh, experience, it wasn't really so hard. Um, but additional to that, there is also the application onboarding part of the job. That's cool. So we've kind of, where have we gone so far? So we, we've talked about <coughs> playing around with a, a, a GitOps controller in the form of Argo CD. Then we said, oh, that's cool, but how can we use it to actually kickstart some development? So we built out our kind of our ubiquitous journey project. Oh, actually, anecdote about Ubiquitous Journey, if you're wondering why it's called the Ubiquitous Journey. Um, it's not because we're mental and we like challenging people to spell complicated words. It's, <laughs> it's, be it's because we went to GitHub, because we know that the, the problem with software is it's difficult to define things and naming things is really, 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 really difficult thing to do. So while we were trying to decide what this DevX or CICD platform was called, uh, we went to GitHub and we had re generate random uh, project name and it came up with Ubiquitous Journey. And the first issue on our backlog was obviously to fix that, uh, only for like um, maybe six weeks of development against the ubiquitous journey for us to all realize that actually it's a really great name and we really like it. And so it's stuck. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I digress. So we've looked at tooling, we've looked at how you can use like a GitOps approach to sort of infrastructure as code, GitOps Git approach to drive your organizational structure and use it as an accelerator for onboarding new groups of new teams with new services that they want to um, deploy to your platform. And so you might be thinking that that's great, but all of this like uh, defines like a pre-built application or like a Helm chart that's been already published. So, you know, how, how did it get there is the question that you might be thinking to yourself. Maybe you're not, but it's a question I thought when we went through this deck earlier. So what about my apps? Um, so CI, CD, CI, CD, CI, CD squared. I mean, who knows what this stuff is called anymore? But uh, but what, what we do is besides put emojis in everything, and this is a quick little screenshot of one of our reference um, uh, pipelines. So we have an approach whereby for any, <clears throat> any commit that someone makes to any branch, it's kind of deemed to be a sandbox build. Uh, and the point I'm trying to show here is that we run through the same pipeline for a sandbox build as we would for like a, like a release candidate. The only difference is that we don't use Argo CD or a GitOps controller if we're just doing like a sort of a lightweight, fast feedback loop to a developer or to, a, to an engineer. Uh, instead, if we move on to the release candidate flow, um, for a release candidate, we will always prepare the environment, run a build, run a bake. So a bake for us is the act of taking the binary and putting it in a box. Uh, and then we will package up our Helm chart, you know, tweak versions, manipulate any variables or update the chart itself if needs be. And then at this point, for deploying to our test environment, we involve a slightly more heavyweight tool such as Argo CD. So when we wanted to make a deployment, we have like Jenkins executing synchronously, running a command by updating a value in Git, at which point then Argo CD, which is our GitOps controller, is detecting that change and then is rolling out that change into the environment. Uh, we've got some web hooks and a few other bits and pieces in place so that the asynchronous synchronous behavior of these two pipelines interacting. 
um, is, is, is pretty much covered. And then what we do is we kick our system test job. And the idea here is that we're trying to disconnect um, no, that's fine. <laughs> the idea is that we're trying to disconnect CI from CD, right? The thing that produces the, the artifacts that we want to deploy is, is life cycled a little bit differently from the things that's actually running the deployment for us. So we love emojis and we didn't know what emoji to put in for testing. We knew cucumbers was obviously the used, only used for cucumber testing. So for our, for our test environment, basically any microservice we have in our system, if you imagine you have 10 microservices, any one of them can push a change and then they kind of narrow at this funnel into our system tests. And at our system tests, we'll then run our UI tests, we'll run some additional API tests, we'll run some, some more integration tests. And we're now validating the app as a kind of collection of other apps or some sort of app of apps, if you will. Um, and once that's been successful, then we sort of say this, this release has passed the quality gate. So we tag it for release and we promote it to the staging environment. And likewise, we could promote on into, into production too. So that's kind of how we get our applications through this process. Mm -hmm. uh, Tamsi, do you want to uh, do a quick little tour of what that looks like maybe? Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to say that Donald mentioned about that, how we do these things in Jenkins and then we pass it to the Argo CD. Um, Jenkins is not the um, only tool that you can do it. Jenkins is just oh, yeah, yeah. there for our CI. The point is here is to separate CI from CD. Now Jenkins is there up to the build point, but then we rely on our GitOps tool to do the deployment. and. Yeah, I remember before, before we used um, before we moved to Argo CD and a GitOps approach, we used to we used to use I think we used to use Ansible for a while. But either way, what we were doing is we were just patching to, to like deployment configs or deployments mm -hmm. in a Jenkins file and saying go do that. And obviously Jenkins was doing it exactly as you would expect. But then the problem was that you know someone would go into the deployment config or to the deployment and be like oh I forgot to expose this environment variable. They'd go and make that change. And then like two weeks later, when we go to move from one cluster to the other, or we delete the environment because we like to kind of practice our infrastructure as code and our ability to recreate all of these things. Um, well, <laughs> I think you've got to delete this. <laughs> I, think we, we, I think we were too hungry while doing it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but Jenkins is really good at all those bits on the left, but it sort of struggles a little bit with maintaining the state. Cool. Anyway, Tansy, do you want to show us some AppSea stuff? Yes. For example, this is an application of application definition for this particular test environment, so to say. And it, it is exactly the same approach as you do with this journey. You have an environment definition in here, and you have all these application definitions um, for each of the um, each of the components for your application that make up this application to here. And as you see in here in these um, comments, you see that those comments are going coming from Jenkins, not from anyone from the team or any other individual. Yeah. And these are all, um, these are happening in the automated way. That's cool. So our like, <laughs> our app configs essentially that define this structure is, is sort of, it's sort of like hands off from a human point of view and it's all automated. So you just see this big string of automated commits on it. So like, uh, Tanzu, if I wanted to roll back something, how would I do that? Oh, well, if you look at the definition of an application, it is, it's an another, Helm chart somewhere and a bunch of other, a bunch of other uh, parameters about this application. If I would like to roll back, I just need to update this in my Git. Or if I would like to uh, go back to an, an older version of this application, I just need to overwrite these parameters in my Git repository. But um, and that that's all. It's just another commit to the Git repository. Magic. Yeah. So, so we really love this approach. Uh, it is really easy for um, business uh, business owners or product owner type of people to see what is running in which environment, in which version, and you know it is it is really traceable because of Git. It is it's highly secure, and you can um, you can follow the each all process uh, you know from start to the end. Yeah, it's really um, really transparent, right? It's really clear and cut, clear and obvious what's deployed where and how easy this rollback. There's no more panic. Oh my god, that version didn't work. How do we go back? It's easy. Just Get reverse or just put another commit on top of it. So if you want to know more, visit our website, visit our repos, and reach out to us either Twitter, from LinkedIn, or any place you will see. We use generally the same handles. So thank you for listening.